I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. There are a couple of um, questions that have come in previously, uh, sort of um, before the meditation that I want to speak to. Uh, Ruby asked, "Are there any? do you have any thoughts, Rick, on what one can do when the year has been one bad thing after another with not much reprieve? It's huge. Um, in my personal go-to list is compassion for myself. So compassion for yourself. Uh, understanding that, of course, it's going to wear on you hard. And I think a sense of perspective is helpful. Just being aware of some of the many causes of what has landed on you somehow helps them to not land so hard. We have a sense of kind of the big picture. Also, uh, a sense of perspective that sometimes stuff happens and it comes in clusters. And this could be a year with one bad thing after another without much reprieve. So there's a kind of perspective that helps. It also really helps to connect with others in community, friends, others who've had losses or difficulties, maybe it's like your own. There's just, we're not meant to suffer alone. And um, it's, it's really, and suffering sometimes separates us from others. When bad things happen, sometimes we lose networks or we're so busy dealing with the bad stuff that we don't have opportunities for connection. And as best you can, it's really important to try to reestablish those for yourself as best you can. And then I think it's fundamentally really, really important. And this is a major factor of resilience. The research establishes to look for what is also true. <clears throat> I have kind of a three-step saying, deal with the bad, turn to the good, take in the good. Deal with the bad. We have to deal with the bad and including endure it sometimes is the only way to deal with it, to endure it. And what is also true? This is not a spiritual bypass or some kind of trick for privileged yuppies. The worse it is, the more important it is to turn to what is also true, the good that is also true. It could be the simple good of, I'm still here, I'm still breathing. It could be a moment of respite. It could be um, an underlying sense of the ground of your own being, which is fundamentally wakeful, peaceful, content, wise, and loving. If we look, we can find that and take our refuge there. That's also true. <clears throat> Flowers blooming are also true. Uh, chocolate is also good. Um, I am now a major fan of Mr. Dewey's cashew-centered ice cream. Yum. Chocolate orange chip. Mmm. That's also true, whatever it is for you. So I guess I would I would say that. And um, I find also to finish that turning to wisdom teachings can really help. Pema Chodron's book, I think When Things Fall Apart, uh, other beautiful teachings. I love Tara Brock's book, Trusting the Gold, um, short and very, very sweet, pithy chapters, each of them about a page in length, if that. Um, just anything that gives you comfort and, and support. Um, and it's okay to seek distractions. You know, try not to do them that are too toxic for you. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, cat videos, movies, you know, what helps you get through to the next day. I, I really wish you best here. Okay, next from a related, perhaps Debbie asks, I hope I will address regret and disappointment one can feel. I'm going to talk more about disappointment. Um, regret, I'll just say that um, it's useful to distinguish that from remorse. We can regret conditions without feeling guilty for them, or we can regret them and also feel guilty or remorseful or even ashamed 
related to them. And so I, th I think it's really helpful to open to the feelings and let them flow and try to get to the bottom of what is it that you really regret and resource yourself so you can feel the piercing of that so that it can flow on through you. Feel it, flow it. That's such a hallmark for um, processing and working with the mind. Then on the other side of it, um, <clears throat> make sure that after you've been feeling it, that you have that you're being fair about it all. Um, that you're not over bla over blaming yourself. Make sure that you're also taking into account what else is true in terms of that which you regret, um, and you know see if it's helpful for you to uh, make you know make amends as best you can, make repairs as best you can, learn the lessons as best you can, and acknowledge all that, and then give yourself permission at a certain point to turn a corner. Turn a page, turn a corner. Not to shove anything down or lie about it or bypass it, but just to give yourself permission to no longer be preoccupied with it. If something happens to stir it up, you might see a picture of somebody or recall something. All right, regret may come up again. But you're not dwelling in it. Um, you're not letting it, as the Buddha put it, you're not letting it invade your mind and remain because you've honorably worked through feeling and flowing it and um, facing your own responsibility, but not overestimating it and making amends, making repairs, learning your lessons. You've earned the right now to turn that corner and to encourage yourself that you're, you're allowed to do that. So that's what I would, I would say about that. Okay. <clears throat> I'm sure there's more I could speak to, but I'm, oh, one more thing. Um, was about how to um, turn to what is true and then take it in. Uh, it may be that when you turn to the good news that is also true, like just you you know it, but you don't feel it. You know, you see the flower blooming, you don't feel anything. You know they like you, but you don't feel it. Um, what helps there is generally to just stay with it and kind of be in, have the intention of letting yourself actually have that experience and protect your attention so it doesn't keep getting distracted to everything else. So you can rest in, you can kind of marinate in, you know, the good that you want to grow inside. That that part is kind of willful sometimes. And it's muscular. And there it is. But mm, mm, you know, you're going to stay with it till you feel it more and more. And then when you do feel it, somebody else asked, how do we let a mind-heart state sink in? Yes, indeed. Rest your sustained attention on it. Um, <clears throat> feel it in your body. Focus on what is rewarding about it. And um, there are other methods as well that are evidence-based in terms of neuropsychology that you can use to deliberately internalize what's helpful and hardwire it gradually into your nervous system. You can find the detail on that in my paper, Learning to Learn from Positive Experiences. You can also find you know, a lot for me about that in various places about taking in the good. My TEDx talk, um, things I've written, um, <clears throat> many guided practices, you know, I use these methods. Um, that's kind of how to do it. Basically, you know, your your mind takes its shape from what it repeatedly rests upon, and so does your brain. So when we take in the good, we have the humility to help ourselves stay with that which is valuable. And we have the support for ourselves that's sufficient to open to it and value it and make room for it inside ourselves again and again and again. And that's going to be really important related to now what I want to talk with you about. Okay, so transitioning to my, my main topic here. As a little bit of a reset, <clears throat> a long time ago, and for many of us in a country far, far away, uh, the Buddha was deeply interested in suffering and what causes suffering, and therefore, what could cause it to come to an end. He made a key distinction that I've already alluded to here with regard to the two darts or two arrows, a key distinction between unavoidable physical and emotional pain from subtle to agonizing, uh, that's distinct, that's distinct from the suffering 
we create ourselves through our reactions to and our approaches to um, life altogether. So in the terminology I'm going to use here, I'm going to make a distinction between pain and, and suffering. Pain includes, of course, you know, a subtle sense of backache all the way to uh, extreme physical pain, and it includes um, emotional pain from subtle to intense, such as the grief we feel uh, when we lose a loved one. That's pain. Now, suffering, he proposed a, a, his drive theory of suffering, in a nutshell, rooted in what he called craving. <clears throat> the idea being that out of ignorance, we uh, fight with things that are painful or imagine threats that are not true. Also, uh, out of ignorance, we chase after pleasures and try to hold on to them, even though they're continually changing, and we have opportunities to feel already content. And we create suffering in our relationships uh, because we get caught up in envy, resentment, feelings of inadequacy, uh, preoccupations with hurt feelings and vengeance and all the rest of that. So we create our own suffering. Now, as a structure for this, uh, I use, uh, I think of craving as a biological evolved condition that has to do with a invasive sense of deficit or disturbance in the meeting of an important need, like safety, satisfaction, and connection. The brain and body broadly have three major systems for coping with life that help us avoid pain um, for safety and help us approach rewards for satisfaction and help us attach to others for connection. This is classic biology and psychology, avoiding, approaching, attaching. So we have these three systems. In my previous talk two weeks ago, I talked about how we can help ourselves with regard to avoiding and safety, how we can help ourselves feel um, not so gripped by needless anxiety and can help ourselves to rest already in a sense of calm strength in the present as we deal with the very real challenges of our life. If you have any kind of a chronic issue with anxiety or you know anyone who does, that exploration two weeks ago could be really useful for you. And I believe I did a meditation that was also related to releasing unnecessary fear and experiencing, to the extent it's true, and it very often is true, that you're actually already all right right now. Basically all right right now, certainly in terms of survival and fundamental safety, when it's true. Tonight, I want to explore with you <clears throat> feeling already content in the present, even as you pursue your goals and deal with obstructions to their, to their attainment. How can we do that as householders? How can we live a goal-directed life? How can we enjoy our pleasures without tipping into the craving related to them that creates a lot of suffering and harm. How can we actually do that? So um, I wanna talk about um, how to do it with you. And I hope you can appreciate the uh, magnitude of this topic. Yeah. How do we not get hijacked continually by chasing grasping one shiny object after another with a brain that's designed by Mother Nature, thanks mom, to do exactly that. So I'm gonna name some things you can do and I'm very interested in you helping yourself having a sense of them. So first, on the one side of it, we need to be mindful of frustration, disappointment, you know, you think something is going to happen in your work or 
you think you're going to be able to enjoy something, you know, go out with friends or, you know, a, a nice thing's going to arrive in the mail or, you know, you thought it was going to work out with someone, uh, you know, in terms of a project and kaboom, there's frustration, there's disappointment. Uh, maybe you're just kind of boggled as, you know, as one can be sometimes by the, uh, I don't know, the lack of effort in some other people. What? So whatever it might be, frustration, disappointment, it might be kind of global, a sense of disappointment or frustration in your career or in how your life has turned out at this so far. I'm not trying to deny anything. I'm saying first we open to and acknowledge and accept what's there. What's there? We allow it. It's crucial. And if we jump over that, that's a spiritual bypass. And our efforts won't have traction because we haven't felt and flowed um, frustration, disappointment, uh, and disappointment. Even addictiveness, really wanting something that you know is not good for you, acknowledging that. Then, once you've acknowledged it, I think that it's really appropriate to make plans and take action. <clears throat> if you realize that you're dealing with people at work who are just not going to um, rise to the occasion, what's your plan for that? If you look at your life and you go, wow, it's kind of boring. It's kind of beige. It's not even beige. <laughs> it's gray. If that's real and it's understandable, okay, what's the plan? And I'm not talking pie in the sky. I just mean realistically, what could you do to accomplish your goals more effectively so there's less frustration and disappointment? And what could you do to bring more aliveness and more pleasure? How could you, you know, be nice to this body? Give it pleasure, you know, take care of it uh, in, you know, wholesome ways. What could you do? So making plans and taking action. No replacement for that. No replacement for that. Maybe you've done it all. If not, it's there to do, okay? And the doing of that, you know, creates kind of a foundation for the more psychological uh, interventions I'm now going to talk about. Having accepted your frustrations and disappointments, having um, let them flow, having taken action as skillfully as you can. Here, we also have to develop a sense of perspective about what a human life can hold. There's a story that um, Chetsunma Tenzin Palmo tells in, I believe, Meditations on a Mountain Lake or Reflections of a Mountain Lake. Anyway, it's her memoir of practice, an English woman who went to Tibet, I believe in the 50s, 1950s, maybe 1960s, and did 12 years on retreat by herself. And um, a lot of it, I believe, in a cave high in the Himalayas. And there was one night where she was meditating, you know, eight, 10 hours a day, Storm was raging. She was completely isolated in this cave. And suddenly, as she was sitting up doing deep meditation, a, a big wall of ice or snow, a big pile of snow that had accumulated above her in the cave, jum, just landed on her, kind of smothering her, Boop. landed on her, shocking her. Boop. And the thought arose in her mind, what did you expect from samsara? Samsara being ordinary reality. What did you expect from samsara? And in that, with that thought, there was tremendous realization and opening and inner peace. You can kind of get the humor in it as well. Uh, and so, uh, probably not at that scale, at least most of the time, we can have a certain realism about what a human life can hold given the hand we were dealt, our circumstances, the genetic lottery, 
misfortune, other people. Um, no one gets through this life without making a catastrophic mistake or two or three. I've certainly made mine. And um, we need to be realistic. So there's a sense of perspective about it. There's a sense of accepting the many causes that manifest how many goodies our life holds and an acceptance of limitations. Where life is not a superhero movie. We have limitations, time, energy, circumstance, what we can actually count on other people for, and being realistic about that. Yeah. A, a little detail, I believe it's true in business that uh, you know, a, a, a large, a giant corporation, very skillfully, is, will roll out a new product uh, in a bunch of supermarkets, let's say. And that product rollout has been after a lot of talent and a lot of money spent on design and testing and focus groups and messaging and all the rest of that. And by the end of the year, probably two thirds of those new products will have failed, even after those best efforts. I think about baseball players heading for the Hall of Fame, there <clears throat> who struck out two out of three times, right? And still they were pretty awesome. So perspective on limitations, okay? So having said all that about those kind of what I think of as big, big chunks, now more and more uh, kind of subtle awareness that takes you to freedom inside. Uh, can you be aware of what I call the go engine? I know it well. <laughs> See the ball, chase the ball, get the ball, look for the next ball. I know it well. That orientation, which can often be quite subtle to getting something done. You see the glass, you want the glass, boom, you go after the glass. It's a kind of machinery. Uh, temperamentally, you know, some people are kind of perhaps more goal-directed than others. I probably have some of that temperament. And then there's training, there's life experiences. I managed some of the things in my childhood by being good at accomplishing academic goals. Um, I also found a lot of pleasure in building my tree houses and my little projects on my own, you know, goal directedness. It's okay, that, but still we develop this machine and it's a machine that is oriented toward what the Buddha called becoming distinct from being. We're chasing the future. We're leaning into the future. Now there's a place for the go machine, the go engine. There's a place for it. In, it's very useful to get something done. Um, it can be very helpful to other people in what it accomplishes. And can we be very careful to use it rather than being auto, on autopilot and being used by it. Can you be aware of the fact that often this go machine, and you might have your own term for it, the go engine, um, is, is on automatic. And it's just continually scanning for something new to want, some new target to then move into the future toward in terms of becoming to acquire one way or another. It's quite remarkable to become increasingly aware of that mechanism operating inside and then to explore what might it be like to use it with an ongoing sense of gratitude and thankfulness and enoughness and, and fullness and contentment already. That's the opportunity here I'm calling out. When we're caught up in the, the Go engine, implicit in it very much typically is a sense of um, a shortfall between the goal and the actual. And so we're then kind of in the experience of that gap between the goal, the ideal, 
the standard and the actual, which does it, it is dissatisfying. There's a sense of dissatisfaction commonly in the operation of that go machinery that you can be aware of. The alternative is to draw on your skills to be productive, to get things done, to have focus and all the rest of that without that subtle strain and contraction and pressure in that machinery of accomplishing. Can you be aware of that? Can you be aware of accomplishing in a typical way with a sense, even subtle, of pressure, contraction, drivenness, demand, insistence. Can you be aware of that when that's present? Alternately, can you be aware of doing the dishes, completing an email, completing a, t a talk? Um, can you be aware of that with an internal lack of contraction, pressure, drivenness, insistence, demand, and instead an internal sense of full of being rather than becoming, an internal sense of fullness, contentment, thankfulness already, already. That's a real question, isn't it? And <clears throat> it's not pie in the sky to be able to get a lot of stuff done this way. We just have to be very mindful of that automatic machinery <clears throat> and the emotions and the feeling of contraction, pressure, and so forth that typically go with it and keep helping ourselves pull out of that um, habitual way of doing things. Then you're not caught up in craving. And this is a major aspect of the great project of the Buddha in very down-to-earth terms, right? How do we accomplish our daily to-do list? And I have a long one. <laughs> of all kinds, including relationship tasks. How do we accomplish all the stuff on our to-do list without getting contracted about it? That's what we're talking about here. So another, so being mindful, first and foremost, of that machinery and which kind of associated attitude and experience you're having is really important. Another thing that's really useful is being aware of what we could call the self-identification with that engine. And if you watch your mind, certainly it's true in my mind, you can see that there's a lot of sense of me, mine, myself, and I associated with this machinery of accomplishing, this machinery of doing. You just watch it, you know, anticipating like, oh, how you know good it will be for me if it has once I accomplish this thing, or um, <clears throat> a, a very strong somatic sense, the somatic sense in the body of me, of I, of being willful determined, competent, valued by others for being really good at accomplishing things. There's a lot of self related there. And that identification with the machinery of doing uh, tends to perpetuate it. It reinforces it. So here too, what's the opportunity to draw on your skills and your your values and your deliberateness and your um, abilities to get stuff done. What's it like to draw on that with a sense that it's moving through you as a person? It's a beautiful, wonderful collection of capabilities, things you've learned how to do, competencies you've developed, even with your own mind. That's moving through the field, the process of being a particular person a body-mind process over time, the person process, the Rick process, the uh, Maureen process, the Brenda process, the Bill process, the Jody process, right? These capabilities are moving through, 
but we don't need to identify with them so much. This too is a very important kind of mindfulness. Mindfulness of identification with um, a way of being or um, a process of doing. You're still here. There's still a person. There's still awareness. There's still executive functions occurring. There's still values. There's still a particular body. But there can be less and less sense of mine. Look at me, (laughs) you know, related to accomplishing. That's something also to explore. If you're interested, as the Buddha was, and I am, I, I believe you are interested in what frees you from habits of suffering, including very subtle habits, and habits that have been well rewarded by society, going all the way back to kindergarten when you got an A for a good book report, uh, or whatever you did, a good Play-Doh sculpture, I guess. Further, this is really, really helpful. Now I'm going to kind of turn the corner on the really good news, I think. When you do accomplish something or finish something, or arrive somewhere, can you really notice it and let it in? Turn to the good, take in the good. Again and again and again. I have found myself so often blowing right through the finish line of some significant task, hardly noticing it, and racing on to the next thing. Nope. Try it. It's a delightful practice. And I am giving it to you, Dr. Rick here, as a prescription for greater ease, greater well-being, and lowering stress, and maybe even improving your health deliberately again and again and again. Notice when when you finish something, when you accomplish something, when you arrive somewhere, including in in an abstract sense of arriving, however that is meaningful to you, when you have a sense of that, let it sink in. Enjoy it. Take that extra beat, that extra breath, to really let it land. You did it. You accomplished it. And as you internalize that experience again and again and again of accomplishment, completion, um, arriving, that will gradually fill you up from the inside out, and it will pull, it will downregulate. It will reduce um, any basis inside you for feeling insufficient or discontent or frustrated or disappointed, which are drivers of this machinery of um, accomplishing and doing. Take in the good again and again. More broadly, a very soulful and existential question, because probably the majority of people here right now are past the midline of the lifespan. Maybe not. Um, There could be some medical breakthroughs, but it's good to have a plan B. And at some point, can you say to yourself, you've done enough. You've been enough. You've had enough. You've tried enough. You've worked enough. You've thought enough. When is enough enough? And it's not that you're saying, okay, it's enough. I'm ready to leave this life now. No, it's more like if there's some internal sense of insufficiency about what you've done and who you are, that's really worth looking at. Now, maybe in you is a project you have been, you you still want to do. You still want to write that poem, that song, that book. You still want to, uh, you know, plant that tomato garden in your backyard. Fine. Fine. Do it. But it's really quite touching. It's very tender and intimate because most of us have never felt like we were enough. I can relate to that. Never felt like we accomplished enough, were enough. It's like a blessing, a benediction that you give to yourself. You know, it's enough. Almost you could frame it as like a prayer. You know, please, may I may I know that I am enough as I am. Am I, may I know that I am enough? May I know that I've done enough? Which then means going forward, you're in the bonus round. (laughs) 
<laughs> you're in victory lap time, <laughs> going around the lap, the track. And again, I want to be crystal clear. The harder your life has been, the more important this blessing is to give yourself that you've really done enough. You may choose to keep on going out of your virtues and your, your kindness for others and your joy in the, in, the, in the race itself. Fine. But can it be on the basis of being already, that word again, already enough? That, that's really something to give oneself. So a couple more suggestions here, along with experiences of accomplishment and enoughness, really turning toward and looking for opportunities for thankfulness and gratitude. Gratitude is about what we've been given, not what we've earned. We can be glad about the paycheck we get, but it's not so much we're grateful for it because there was something transactional there, and that's fine. With gratitude, there's the vulnerability and the humility and the dependence to realize, wow, I've been given this. It's kind of scary sometimes to face gratitude. Bob Emmons, a scholar of gratitude, has talked a lot about issues people have with feeling grateful because it makes them feel vulnerable and dependent. They don't want to face that. Well, guess what? You are dependent. I am dependent. I'm dependent on the oxygen in this room, which if I don't consume some, I'm going to be in big trouble in a minute or two. So we're dependent. We can receive gratitude. We can focus on it. That's really important. Little practices of gratitude. It's great, great, great. Again, the fullness, the receivingness of thankfulness and gratitude uh, downregulate the machinery of craving that aims toward chasing after one shiny object after another. Also, you can have a sense, especially in meditation, of the fullness of the arising present in its own nature. Like if you just slow it down, you know, the brain is filtering out probably some estimates, you know, 90, 99% of the various stimuli bombarding us. It's just filtering it out in terms of the making of any moment of consciousness because it's overwhelming. Well, if you kind of um, soften the filters consciously and be aware of so many sounds, sights, sensations, thoughts, and all the rest arising, continually, there's so much there, you can really have a chance of experiencing the fullness in the present moment. Kind of gobsmacked with gratitude. Wow. Like a little kid, you know? Like a little baby or a toddler reaching out and grabbing their toe, their foot, and holding it up to their face because they can bend, you know, a six-month-old, and staring at their big toe. Wow. A big toe, whoa, fullness right there. And then last, um, in terms of helping ourselves feel already content, right? Uh, in the present, even as we pursue our goals, it's useful to be aware of what it feels like to feel content. To my amazement, when I, as I've developed this framework of our three major needs and approaching, avoid, avoiding, approaching, and attaching to manage our needs and the green zone versus the red zone, green zone when we feel that needs are met enough in the present, to my surprise, <clears throat> as someone who is temperamentally maybe a little anxious, I'm really pretty okay. I don't have a lot going on with challenges to safety. I mean, I'm privileged and fortunate. I'm not dealing with actual serious challenges, but, you know, health concerns as you age, uh, other things, I'm not that preoccupied with that. It's, it's fairly easy for me to access a sense of peacefulness. Similarly, it's fairly easy for me to access a sense of love in terms of needs met enough in the present for safety on the one hand and connection on the other. And you might ask yourself, what's kind of true for you? But I have a confession to make. To my amazement, I realized, wow, wow, it's actually hard for me to feel content, in part because I have that major, you know, go engine running in the background much of the time. So it might serve you to bring your attention, as I am doing myself, 
over the past year or two to what it feels like to be content. Including, not just when you're content, you're on the couch or whatever, and it's all fine and everything's okay, but can you feel already content while you're doing things? That's more of a challenge. But just starting with a moment of feeling content. That can include frustration. It can include sorrow. But underneath it all, you know, as kind of a mood in which things are occurring, you've released discontent, at least in the present. Like in the present, you've created some space or distance between you and dissatisfaction or discontent. And you can allow yourself to feel enough and arrived and thankful and content. Okay. And I have to say for the world that, as I want to make a passing comment, that this practice of feeling already content is crucial if humanity is to survive the next hundred years. I think we'll get through the next 10, but with um, the inexhaustible pace of appetite and the, con the go engine and continually chasing more, we're gonna hit some serious limitations in our resources really soon. And being able to be content as an individual helps us be strong and to, to join with others who are strong in realizing what I believe Schumacher wrote about or for the Club of Rome, uh, I'm mixing two things here, back in the 1950s, the limits to growth. So contentment is not just personal, it has political implications. And um, it's not a selfish thing to help yourself feel content. There's a saying in Taoism, one who knows when enough is enough always has enough.